Our calling was founded by DTS alum Wayne Walker, who continues to serve as its executive director and pastor to the homeless. During his youth, Wayne's family actively pursued the scriptural commandment to love your neighbor as yourself by modeling the life of Jesus to scores of foster children whose own origins represented generations of human brokenness, dysfunction, sexual exploitation, and abuse. Early exposure to these destructive forces set him on a path that would lead him to earn a master's degree in cross-cultural ministry from Dallas Theological Seminary. It was while completing his studies at the campus in downtown Dallas, here we are, that Wayne was called to befriend and minister to men and women in the homeless community. During that time, he began to establish personal discipleship-oriented relationships with homeless individuals, many in the same urban setting where he and his family continue to work to this day. Wayne and his wife, Carolyn, have been married for 21 years, and they have four children, ranging from age 12 to 19. And Carolyn is here. Where is Carolyn? Carolyn, would you please raise your hand? Big. There you go. Okay. The Walker's life and ministry calling certainly model the slogan of DTS, teach truth and love well. On a personal note, it has been a blessing for me and for my family to do a long season of life with the Walkers. In particular, Wayne and I have had opportunities to play in the band together along with Carolyn. And I have been up close and personal to watch them as they have raised their children, as we've all raised our children together. And I can truly call him a dear friend that lives out what he preaches. Would you please join me today in welcoming Wayne Walker. Good afternoon. I have to start with a confession. And it's not anything that you ever want someone to start off with, right? Telling you everything that's wrong with them. But here it goes. I have a confession. And I have a theory that this confession is not only true in my life, it's true in yours. Sometimes we get so focused on doing the work of ministry, we get so focused on what we think is what we're called to do that we forget the most important thing. We get so busy on the programs, we get so busy on the papers, we get so busy on the sermon preparation that we forget the most important thing. In fact, I think sometimes we do a lot of good and forget the great. We do a lot of good and sometimes, unfortunately, exchange that for the great. This morning, I wanna look at uh, the greatest commandment that the Lord gave it's recorded in a couple of different uh, gospels. And so that tells us that uh, it was important enough that a few of them wrote it down, right? So this morning, I want to read this together about the greatest commandment. In Matthew 22, it says this, When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him again. Now, just before this, people are trying to trick Jesus, right? They tricked him with another question of, about marriage. And here they're trying to trick him with a question about the commandments. They're trying to trick him about what's the most important. One of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second was equally important to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. Jesus gave us the cliff notes version, right? He took all the law and the words of the prophets and summarized them into one little fortune cookie just for us, right? It's not hard. We don't have a hundred jobs. He brought it down to one focus, and so often in my life, I get distracted by trying to do good things that I forget the great thing. I try to do good stuff and I forget the great stuff. 
And the greatest thing is this right here. And it starts with these words. He says, love the Lord. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. How do we love the Lord? Well, where I work, my wife and I have the privilege of serving a lot of people that sleep outside every day. And their needs are very obvious. Often we get inundated by their felt needs and often forget about their real needs. Right, you crawl in the woods or you meet somebody under a bridge and you think this guy needs some food. He needs medical care, he needs mental health care. He needs a shower, right? You got all these physical felt needs in life. We try to feed people. We probably serve 3,000 meals a week. We can do up to 10,000 loads of laundry a year because laundry is important because it brings people in so we can address the real needs, right? We've developed systems to track the resources we give out and we, we take care of all the clothes and, and all the feminine hygiene products and all the socks and shoes and blankets and backpacks and all this stuff because those are felt needs, right? We built a system where we track accountability and we know the last time you got this and no, you can't have that because you had it a week ago and we know every single item we've ever given out to anybody for years, we give it out over 2,000 items a week that we track and use each one of those as a tool for the gospel. Every single one of those is a tool for an opportunity to communicate about Jesus. Every single one of those is an opportunity to say, yes, you have needs, but I bet your needs are greater than just that thing. A woman comes in today and brings in her laundry in a garbage bag and we give her a basket and she fills up the, ba the basket and we take it from there. We will wash it, we will dry it, we will do everything and return it to her because she needs laundry, right? What you don't know is she's in an abusive relationship and it's not her laundry. She's being beat up on a regular basis and the guy's making her bring his stinky underwear to get laundered. And the opportunity there for three hours in laundry is to really figure out how can we love her well? It is so easy to get focused on the laundry. It's so easy to get focused on the needs. We have all these programs. Everybody's got programs, right? We got programs for recovery. We got programs for life skills. This morning we had small groups. Imagine that, small groups in the homeless community. It works, right? This morning, we have our small groups meeting and they're discussing how to deal with issues in their life with the facilitator one-on-one -on -one, and men together and women together talking about real life and how do they address this. We go out and we try to serve people in a lot of ways and we think we're doing a lot of good, but sometimes we get distracted and we forget to do the great. Because all that stuff and all those programs and all those needs are important, but if those men and women do not love God, then what's the point? If we don't introduce them to a God that desperately loves them, if we just continue to get distracted by all the stuff and all the good work and forget to get to the great work, what have we really accomplished? But it's not just them and our methods and our process that lose focus of the great. I think you and I do too. You and I in Christian leadership, as we are serving, we get so busy teaching other people how to love God and writing curriculum on how to love God and a sermon series on loving God. And you taught summer camp for those people on how to love God. Have you paused for a moment to love God yourself? Are you teaching something that you're not doing? Is the relationship with God that you're trying to promote a distant relationship in your own life? Do you really pause and are you really loving the God? Are you letting that good interrupt the great? And here's three ways I do this and I confess these to you. We focus on programs over people, right? Have we gotten the thing done? Have I finished that exegetical about this intimate detail about the Lord and really figured out the textual criticism comments about this without really figuring out how that detail about the Lord affects my relationship with him. The book you're writing, the class you're teaching, we get focused on the curriculum and we forget about the relationship. We seek physical growth rather than spiritual growth. 
We see this in churches all the time. We challenge it in our church all the time. We challenge it in our programs. Are we more interested on how many butts and seats than we are about our own relationship with the Lord? And does my relationship with the Lord reflect in the way that I'm loving other people? We preach what we don't take time to practice. Do we make enough time for our relationship with the Lord? You think you just showing up late for things and not being prepared for things and turning stuff in late and not answering all those emails is just a symptom of being busy? It's probably a symptom of someone who's also too busy to stop and spend time with the Lord. You're not gonna wake up one day and be that person that has an intimate quiet time. You're gonna, if you want that, you have to be that person that fights for that every single day. You have to be the person you wanna become, not just wait for it to get there. Your intimate relationship with the Lord, the amount that you love the Lord has to reflect in everything you do. Otherwise, nobody wants to hear you. Nobody wants to speak to you. Your book is worth nothing. Your intimate relationship with the Lord and the amount that you love him has to be reflected. Do we really love the Lord? Or we just talk about loving the Lord, but we do really love the Lord. And I love it. He says, you know, with, with all your heart and all your mind and all your, your soul and another gospel, he adds all your strength. Basically, if you were to remove all those things from you, you got nothing left. Do you love him with everything you've got? Is he the priority in your life? Not one of them, the priority in your life. Do we really love him the way he wants us to love him? I've got a friend of mine who's a serial entrepreneur. He even teaches people how to be entrepreneurs. He started lots of companies. We were talking the other day and he said, you know, Wayne, if God chose to not know something, right? He knows everything. But if there's one thing he would choose to not really care about and know, it's probably your vocation. Not that important to him. You stand before the Lord one day and you're like, look at my business card. You see the title, the name, the organization. I ran this thing. I planted this church. I had this ministry. I taught this class. What if God looked at you and said, really? I wouldn't pay attention. Sounds cool. Awesome. But did you love me? Did you love me with everything you had? Did you love me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength? Did you love me? not teaching people to love me, not talking about loving me. Did you love the Lord? The next thing he says is this statement about loving your neighbor, right? Uh, love your neighbor as yourself, right? We all have got examples of doing this. We've all done it. We've probably got our, our Instagram feed with pictures of us loving neighbors, right? Here's some examples, right? We go out and we, we love people. We, we want to minister to them where they are. I love the whole uh, go and make disciples, not sit back and wait for them. So we have teams that visit over a thousand locations a year. We go under bridges, behind liquor stores, deep in the woods. we we find bodies, we find babies, we find families in dire need. We see women escaping domestic violence every single day. Every single day, we see human trafficking, sex trafficking, and domestic violence in this city. Every single day, every single day. Love your neighbor, right? We're gonna go to them. We're gonna love on them. We've even built some apps to help people love the neighbors, right? So we have this app on the app store. Don't download it now. If you really love Jesus, you'll have it on your phone. It's kind of a spiritual test, right? <laughs> the Our Calling app, we built it to find where's the closest shelter? Where's the closest domestic violence center? We were meeting with police officers a few years ago and the police were calling us and saying, what do we do in this situation with this woman? And we're trying to get her in a DV center and we only know of two. Like, don't you know the rest of them in the county? Don't you know if someone pulls up in your car and they have no food where they can eat today. So we built an app to be able to do that in Dallas. Well, the problem with the app store is it's not really localized. So people started downloading this app all over the country, all over the country. And we don't want them to all come to Dallas to find something to eat or come to Dallas for DV resources. So we had to build a database. It's the largest curated database of nonprofits that work with the extreme poor. 
It ha now has over 100,000 resources nationwide. So anywhere in the country, you pull out your phone, you can find the closest shelter, domestic violence center, food pantry. It's crowdsourced. A lot of people are giving us data on it. And it's being used in every state in the country now. It's actually now being used in Europe. People are using it in Mexico. In Dallas alone, in Dallas alone, just in Dallas, it delivers over 7,000 referrals a week. It works. It's helping people love their neighbor, right? See somebody in need, you point them to the good. Or the person themselves, 70% of the homeless community that we serve have cell phones. They have cell phones. Not only can you report, hey, there's a tent in the woods there, but now we have homeless friends taking selfies saying, I'm in the woods here. Come help me. I need help. A few weeks ago, we had a woman, because you can submit any picture, we had a woman submit a picture of a sonogram. And her message was, I'm homeless and I'm pregnant and I don't know where to go. How do we love that neighbor? We also built another app, an intensive case management app. It's funny because I used to be a software developer and uh, you know, paid for college and part of seminary and, and kind of got out of that and got in different kinds of technology. But the reason why I got out of the software development is I got tired of working on the next version of an app and really wanted to focus on the next version of a person. We were here in seminary and it was time to just let it go. Jump off the cliff and let it go. We took a, a huge cut in pay. I took a job at a church pushing a mop. That was a great opportunity to just learn to love people well. But I thought I'd never be in technology again. So now we've written our second app. Um, it's an intensive case management app. We've been collecting data on the unsheltered homeless community. Again, we focus on the unsheltered, the people that sleep outside every day. When I was a seminary student here, there used to be a really nasty motel across the street full of all kinds of prostitution and drug use. And, you know, going back and forth and seeing to class and seeing these men and women struggle with real needs gave me a hunger just to love on them. Crawling under bridges in Dallas, I love that. Going in the woods, I love that. That's just my gig, right? That awkward conversation with a stranger, man, I love that. Awkward keeps me up at night. I love it, right? And we track data on people all over the city. We've got, you can use one app to report to us where you see a homeless person. We use our internal app to go find them. And so we've got data on where people are staying. This is a, re a location someone reported to us, a panhandler. This is a location um, where we get information from the city of Dallas. We're tied connect directly to their system, right? I don't think they really wanted us to. We just found an API and connected and pulled it in. And so there's... <laughs> There's not a homeless encampment. There's not a homeless ticket for sleeping in public. There's not a, a panhandler ticket written that we don't have immediate access to. And then we track data on people that we serve because we want to love our neighbors, right? So we want to get to know people well. We want to intimately disciple them. Who's your baby daddy? Who's your boyfriend? What's your drug of choice? What are the GPS coordinates where you slept with? When's the last time you got a pair of shoes? Who's mentoring you? Do you know the Lord? What's your theology look like? What's your mental health care condition? What challenges are you going through? And do we have a picture of those bruises that guy left on you last week? So we can really work with law enforcement and really help you in a strategic way. We wanna love our neighbors. Everybody wants to love their neighbors, even non-believers. Non-believers are interested in a lot of the things we're doing, which is really cool. You know, every once in a while you look up and someone walks in to talk to you and you're like, well, why is this person here? A month ago, these two guys walked in to see me. The guy on your right is John Donovan. He's a former CEO of AT&T Communications. He just retired a week ago. I've gotten to know him really well. The guy on the left is Satya Nadal. He's the CEO of Microsoft, the largest company in the world, the largest technology company on the planet. And he comes into our calling to talk to us about our app. The first thing I get to tell him is, I'm a Jesus guy. I wanna tell you why I'm a Jesus guy and what we do. And then I wanna talk about software. The opportunity we have to love neighbors extends way beyond. We go to 9,000 different places in Dallas. And some of you go to further places than that. Some of you are teaching in a seminary across the globe. Some of you are, are working with refugees down in Vickery. Some of you are, are, are mowing the lawn for your neighbor next door. But when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, I'm wondering if we're kind of sometimes missing it. 
Because we do a lot of good, but I think sometimes we forget the great. Because not only do we love neighbors on the other side of the planet, we go to the other side of the country in a natural disaster, we go to different states, we go to the other side of the city, but how often do we forget those neighbors that share our last name, that live in our home? You know, they kind of fit that bill too. I lose focus and forget that loving the Lord is very important, the most important. I forget that loving my neighbors includes my family. How many times have I been on a call, Dart calls me because some homeless guy is trying to kill himself and he's, I get a call and they say, this guy just keeps screaming your phone number, Wayne, so we called you and can you come down? And how many times have I been on those kind of situations while my dinner gets cold and my family looks at an empty seat? How many times have I gone to speak somewhere when my family really needed me? And do I really love them well? Ministry is hard. It's a challenge. We see all the time people having to make sacrifices, but don't you dare sacrifice your family on an altar of ministry. I don't care who you are and how cool you think you are and what you're teaching and how irreplaceable you think you are. If your family needs you in a crisis, they are most important. Skip that class. Cancel that speaking engagement. Skip the whole summer to pursue your children, whatever it takes. One day you'll have a cool business card. You may already have one with your name and a title and maybe some little cool logo on the side. But there will be a day when someone else will have that same title with that same business card, just a different name. There's a stack of resumes that could fill all of our jobs. There's seven and a half billion people on this planet. I promise you there are lots of them that can do your job, many that can do it better than you. But there is only one person that God's ever created on this entire rock that can love your family the way he's called you to. There is no backup. There is no stack of resumes for that job. There is no backup person on the, on the guidelines where they can do this search committee to find someone else to love your family the way God has called you to. There's no backup for that. And so when we're loving our neighbors, do we really love the ones that God has charged us with? Your right and your ability to just go and do and blow safety and security to the wind, you gave that up when you got married. And you gave that up more when you had kids. They are your priority. You know, men, I love it in Ephesians, it says, love your wife like Christ loves the church, which is scary and I still can't figure it out. But she's not called to love you like that. You're not called to love your ministry like that. Women, there is no other person on the planet that you are called to love and pursue the way God has called you to love and pursue your husband. There is no ministry, there is no job, there is no position that is greater than you pursuing your family. And your priorities are worthless coming from your lips. Your priorities are spoken through your actions. This is the way good interrupts the great with me when I'm trying to love my neighbor. Have I been pursuing strangers over my own family. I can't tell you how many times I passed out the four spiritual laws. My hands were stained yellow for years, right? But what about my own family? Do we focus on the mission field and ignore our home? Our home. There are times when you have to leave home. There are times when you have to leave the mission field and come home. There are times when you have to skip whatever that thing is and really pursue your family. And I know there's some people who disagree with me. I got a mic, I'm not afraid to use it. You need to pursue your family and love them well. When I stand before the Lord, I don't think he's gonna ask me any questions about any homeless people. It's my wife and my kids. That's what I'm called to do. Are you willing to take a higher calling? What I mean by that, are you willing to step away from your profession? 
Are you willing to step away from that title you longed for for so long? Are you willing to step away from that project even right before it begins to take a higher calling to pursue your family? Do we really love the Lord? Do we really love our neighbor? There's another part of this verse that I find really, really interesting. You know, Jesus says here, I'm going to highlight it here. Um, So he says, love the Lord, right? Love the Lord with all your heart, right? And all your soul and all your mind. And then he says this thing here that says, love your neighbor as yourself. What in the world does he mean by the as yourself part? What does he mean by that? I mean, that makes my head hurt. What, what does it mean? You know, textual criticism guys read this one little word and they just get hurt over it. And they go to the hospital and come back home because their head cracked open. They just don't know what does he mean by that. And this is one of those, I don't know what he means by this as yourself. But I promise you, if you're pursuing your neighbors and ignoring your own needs, something's wrong. I'm not talking about me time. I'm not talking about retail therapy every time the new iPhone comes out either, okay? I'm talking about you taking care of basics with yourself. Simile, as, I can't remember, like or as is a simile metaphor. Y'all tell me, I can't remember. It's been a long time since I graduated from college. Um, Love your neighbor as yourself. Somewhere there's a connection between those two. And how are we loving ourselves? Let me tell you, there's, there's a lot of trauma in ministry. There's a lot of trauma that we see as we love people and we serve them. You cannot pretend to be tough and calloused enough that you can see all this trauma and not recognize that it's traumatizing you. You can't pick up broken things and sharp things without them breaking and cutting you as well. A few years ago, I was in a really dark place and I learned what secondary trauma is. All the trauma and all the horror we see traumatizes us. I also got to know what compassion fatigue means. It doesn't just mean I'm tired at the end of the day. There are real issues in ministry and we have to take care of ourselves. And for us, it means maybe going to see a doctor Don't be the hypocrite that tells everybody they need counseling and ignore that you need it as well, okay? Don't counsel everybody on how to be married and not recognize your marriage also needs some help. You're not that cool. You're not that tough. You can only pretend it and fake it for so long. It's somewhere, not only do we need to pursue the Lord and loving him at all costs, Do we not only need to pursue and love neighbors at all costs, but really focus on the ones that are closest to us? But we also have to figure out what that as yourself means. Some of you are hurting. With our staff, one of the things we like to say is we are wounded shepherds leading wounded shepherds who are leading wounded sheep. You can't be around that much pain without it causing some pain in your life. I'm a superhero movie fan. Uh, Tobey Maguire series of Spider-Man. I think he was the best one. I'll argue with any of you about that. (laughs) But Spider-Man number two, there's there's a tagline for the movie and it says, how long can one man battle the darkness before he finds it within himself? How long can one man battle the darkness before he finds it within himself? Your job creates stress on you and your family. Emotionally, physically, psychologically, spiritually, that as yourself, somewhere in the midst of there. I think of my car, right? When these lights come on, it tells me something's wrong. Some of you have lights on in your life that tells you something's wrong. And yeah, you need a mentor, but you probably need a lot more than a mentor. Most of you need counseling. Some of you need psychiatric help. It's okay. I need glasses or I don't see well. And for me, I take meds or I don't think well. We need to make sure we're okay. 
we also need to make sure that we are capable of doing those great things. Monday night, I'm in a hospice center reading the book of Psalms to a dear friend of mine as she took her last breath. I've known her for almost 15 years. She has over 20 convictions for prostitution and more for theft, more for assault. This woman has been wounded more than you will ever know. As I'm sitting there in that hospice center, reading to her, watching her struggle for breath, a thought never crossed my mind. I wonder if I gave her enough sandwiches. It never crossed my mind. I wonder if she had a place to get a clean shower or laundry. I wasn't concerned in that moment of where she was living or how many different homes she'd been in and lost. In that moment, it's only did she love the Lord. I have no doubt in my mind that God loved her desperately. I have no doubt in my mind that the cross of Christ is an example of his pursuit of her. Even as the woman they would have stoned. But in that moment, my concern was not about how many Bible studies she went to or if she joined a program or finished one, it was, did she love the Lord? And I believe she did. I got to see some fruit. I got to see some growth. Then I got to see some relapse and I got to see some frustration. She never figured out how to conquer sin, but neither of you. We're all in different stages of brokenness and redemption. The most important thing in that moment was not how much good she had seen or how good we had been to her, but did she know the great one? And did we focus on the greatness of just her loving the Lord? When I'm in that hospice bed one day, no one's gonna care about our ministry and how big it is or how many staff we have and blah, blah, blah. What's gonna matter most is do I love the Lord? What's gonna matter most is did I love my neighbors focused on my family? Are they gonna be there in that room with me? And are they gonna know by my actions and not just my words that I loved them completely? And that as yourself, if I don't take care of that, I'm gonna be in that hospice bed a lot sooner than I wanna be. We have to figure out in ministry how to manage these weird challenges, when to go to that meeting and when to stay home, when to teach about a relationship with the Lord and when to practice it, when to love other people and when to take care of ourselves. I mean, at least go to the doctor on a once in a while. It's a tough job. What you're entering to is a challenge because it's easy to get distracted and lose focus. But at the end of my life, my goal is not that our calling has another location and a lot more staff and all that other mess. It's not that we build an app that other people use in other states. It's not even that we serve a lot of food. My goal and my job is to love the Lord and to love my neighbors well. And I believe when I stand before the Lord, those are the questions he's gonna ask me and I know those are the questions he's gonna ask you. Can I pray for us? Father, we get dazed and confused. We lose focus over the great by all the busyness of the good. I pray, Lord, that you would convict us about our intimacy with you and loving you well, that you would convict us about how we love our neighbors, the strangers and the family members, and Lord, you would convict us of taking care of ourself in a healthy way. Lord, you summed this up for a reason 
And you gave it to us today for a purpose. I pray, Lord, that you would continually transform us into the image of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.